special episode of Dopey, the podcast on drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. And my name is Dave, and I'm sitting here uh, via Zoom with a very sweet man. You're a very sweet man. I've spoken to you a couple times already, and you're just oozing with sweetness, and I appreciate that. His name is Skinny Vinny Imperati. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me, man. It's, it's, it's an honor. I really appreciate it. Yeah. An honor. That's hey, come on, take it. Yeah. Come on. Take it. <laughs> no, it it really is an honor because I uh, right just a few minutes ago I was uh, on your guys' YouTube page and you're interviewing guests like Jamie Lee Curtis and and and, <laughs> and uh, I mean that's just that's because I work I work in a very famous restaurant and she was in my re- the restaurant I work at and uh, okay uh, I, like just went nuts and I tracked her down and. And then I bothered her forever. You know what I mean? It was one of those. Things. <laughs> well, still, man, just to, just to be, uh, um, and this, this goes, I was on another podcast and they're interviewing people like, like Charlie Sheen and, and, uh, and other big people like that. So to, to, ha- to have people to be, to be involved with the podcast that are interviewing people like that, people I looked up to people that are big in the entertainment industry. It's uh it's an honor for sure. Well, I appreciate well, that. And it's an honor to have you on Dopey as well. Um, you. Cause you, you have like, I guess people are going to watch this video. We ne- I just started adding video to the whole thing. So if you want to mm-hmm. watch it, it'll be on YouTube, but if you're not watching it, you need to know Vinny is in this very stylish room. He's got a, his podcast is called moist cheeks and he's got a <laughs> moist cheeks neon in the back, all these <laughs> decks. He's got a nice light on him. Leopard skin bucket hat, leopard skin <laughs> sheath on the fucking mic stand. You, you look like a very happy person. And and it also needs to be said before we start that Vinny's yeah. story is fucked up. You know, you're a fucked up drug addict, Vinny. I'm sorry mm-hmm. to tell you. And, Super uh, fucked up. <laughs> yeah, you're a fucked up drug addict. And like that yeah. was the whole point of the show. So the fact and also I guess the point is you just celebrated three years or you're about to. Yeah, no, just celebrated three years, February 10th. So congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank but you. the point is, here you are, fucked up drug addict, in recovery, looking so happy. Yeah. You know, you know, such a vibe coming off of you. Yeah. I that 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 really means a lot when you say that. Um, because that's really that's something that I'm really trying to put out there. Um and and trying to make that my brand is and, and it's funny because like like I said when I was uh, listening to the Jamie Lee Curtis just in the just in the first few minutes it said that uh, I think it was you who mentioned that it, uh, um, you could have fun in sobriety you could you could be happy you know what I mean and and that's my biggest fucking thing is sobriety and recovery doesn't have to be boring and that was a huge thing that that scared me to be honest to get sober. Because I, if I was going to be miserable, fucking sober, I, I'm just going to continue to get loaded. I'll just be miserable loaded because I love getting high so much. So to be able to be this, this content with the person who I am now and being able to, the biggest thing is being able to love myself, right? I, I, can't, I can't put love into the world. I can't love anybody else without loving myself first, you know? So being content with the person who I am today and this happy it's it's really what i want people to know and understand that it's fucking possible totally i I think it's interesting because i i heard you know i i it's like did drugs make me happy you know what i mean like i know that i love drugs i loved how drugs made me feel and you and i use the same drugs so like we probably crave the same thing and i know that that i loved um not having to worry. Right. I loved feeling like everything was cool. Everything mm-hmm. was okay. And I, and I loved being, I loved even saying the word, I want to get fucked up, like as yeah. fucked up as possible. Like that was mm-hmm. a, a part of it. And, and I don't remember being like, this makes me happy. You know what I mean? I think the happiness came from not worrying, you know totally. what I mean? So it was like that, that the self-medicating to not have to be super anxious or neurotic in my in my case like that's just my go-to is anxious and neurotic um what do you think the the core is for you i want to hear your whole story but this is an interesting conversation i think in in the beginning i I started getting loaded um 
like everybody else, my, my mid teenagers smoking weed, drinking, drinking booze, you know? Um, and yeah, at first, at first the drugs did make me happy. The drugs and alcohol did make me happy. And, and I was just a, a regular normal teen, you know, I love the skateboard, love, love sports, you know, um, skateboarding plays a major role in my whole life. And, um, and, but once it got to, I, I just love the feeling of being intoxicated, no matter what drug it is. People ask me all the time, what was your drug of choice? Whatever fucking got me high. I don't care what it was. My main drug was heroin and crack. But I, it, like, if you had fucking crystal meth, I would shoot crystal meth. If you had PCP, I, you. Would do, I would do PCP. You know, it didn't, didn't matter what it was. I just loved being high. You know, I just loved the feeling of being high. And once, once the opiates came into the picture, that's when really sh- shit hit the fan. And... Still to this day, after after working a program and doing the steps, I, I still, it's very hard to me to uh, for me to like really pick the core and see what were the main reasons. Maybe it was family orientated. Maybe it was I was resentful at the world. Maybe it was I was playing the victim card. Oh, why me? My father? Why did my father have to die at such a young age? You know what I mean? We grew up poor. Why me? Why me? Maybe that played a major role in it. But at the end of the day, it's like my mom did her best to raise me. She worked a full-time job. She worked at Yale University. Um, she spoiled me. And I, I, had, I had friends. Uh, I played sports. You know, it, I had a normal childhood. But when the opiates came into the picture, it just like, it switched my, my way of thinking. It, it switched my perception of life. And it, it turned me into a person that I, I, like, when I think back at it now, it's like, I, I can't even believe that I did the things that I did back in those years. And it, it just, it turned me into a monster and it turned me into somebody who just had no care for anybody, no care for anything, no care for myself. And um, started doing things that, fuck man, that I'm ashamed of, you know? And, um, and, and, and it got to a point where, I accepted that it was going to be, that's going to be me for the rest of my life. Right. I was home. Right, I was right. homeless, living in a fucking porta potty, shooting dope with rainwater. Don't and give I, it I, all I, away, Vinny. We, we, <laughs> let's just get to the beginning. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, go, yeah. don't give it all away. It's like, yeah. dude, I, I want, I mean, like you, you had a tough childhood, obviously. Your dad died mm-hmm. when you were, how old were you when your dad died? I was two. Oh my God. So you never knew yeah. your dad. No. Never, never knew my father. Um, he got, he got hit by, he was a biker. He got hit by a drunk driver while he was on his bike. Terrible, terrible. And you grew up uh, in the Northeast. You grew up in Connecticut, yep. Yep. Um, which is, you know, where I actually, that's where me and Chris met in Canaan, Connecticut. Okay. At, the, at this rehab called Mountainside. Um, but I want to know, um, because it's a long leap, you know, from, from stonerdom uh, you know, being a kid to being a fucking homeless heroin addict in a porta potty shooting rainwater, right? It's a yeah. big leap. But I, I know a little bit about you and your mother was a drug addict, right? Yeah, yeah. My mom was a drug addict. She was a heroin addict as well. Um, and she, I, I could remember being really young and not really knowing exactly what it was, but I, I would I would sneak in her room and find needles and find dope bags and but again, I really didn't know what that shit was. But as I got older, I started to understand and, and realize. And um, I remember this moment like it was fucking yesterday. She she picked me up from a baseball game. We're driving home and she starts nodding out at the wheel. And I just started crying. And I said, listen, you you lost. We lost our, my father. My sister's not in the picture anymore. You're going to lose me if you don't stop doing that shit. And from that night, she, uh, the next day she got on the methadone program and never put another needle in her arm, but she's still on the methadone program. And I'm sure that fucked her up to hear that from her 10 year old. Right. Totally. Yeah. And, um, she, she's still on the methadone program and she, it's, it's like past the point of no return. She's been on the methadone program for not necessarily, not necessarily. Listen, I mean, I, I was on methadone seven years or something. 
Uh, not that seven years is 25 years. I'm just saying you never know what the point of no return is. That's you know, true. she could fucking she could kick a milligram a month for years. That's that's very true. Up. Did you hear this story about um, I want to say his name is Johnny Winter. It's an amazing story. Did you hear the Johnny Winter story? I don't think so. All right. I'm gonna, I told it on this show before, but you need to hear it. So I'm going to tell yeah, you yeah. this story. I think it was Edgar Winter. Either it was Edgar Winter or Johnny Winter. They're albino guitar players, like big time rock and roll heroes. Okay. Uh-huh. And I want, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Edgar Winter. Anyway, he was on Methadone for 25 years or something. Right. Mm-hmm. And he was touring, touring the world, big time guitar player, heroin addict, obviously. And he, his family were his tour managers and they got really tired of dealing with him, nodding out. And they even got tired of him being on Methadone. But they knew that he was too scared to come off the methadone. So Mm the guy started weaning him with him not knowing for years, right? Mm -hmm. And they got to a point where they started giving him an empty gel cap of the methadone. And then for his birthday, they gave him a box. And in the box, 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 there was a pill. And he's like, what the fuck are you giving me this methadone? Uh, as my birthday gift in all the boxes. And they're like, no, open up the gel cap. And they open it up. And he goes, you've been clean for a year. He had wow. been off the methadone for a year and he didn't even know it. Wow. That's how you know that your mother might not be at the point of no return. This dude's a serious junkie. I'll send you the yeah. link. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You know what Please I'm saying? do. Like, it, might be, wow. it might be a whole thing. So it's yeah. it's crazy. That, now, that, that is crazy. Up, was your house like Sons of Anarchy? Your mother no. was like, the, <laughs> no. No, nah, no. Nah. My, my mom, she, um, she was a, what they call a, a functioning drug addict. She was still able to, um, to hold a full-time job. And, and the job that she worked was a, was a very, um, demanding physical job. She was the, um, the head groundskeeper for Yale university for the athletic department. And, uh, which means she, she oversaw the, the Yale football field, the, all, all the, all the sports fields, you know, um, landscaping. And, um, she, she's still, she's still doing that to this day. And, um, she's been there for over 30 years now. She's, uh, um, she just got some major knee surgery and she's trying to retire in the next couple months. Um, but yeah, she, she was always able to keep a job. She was always able to keep food on the table. Um, most of my life we were living paycheck to paycheck, but she did her best to, um, to really, um, to really make sure that I was okay. And that I, that I always went to school and, um, yeah, I, I, I give her credit because I wouldn't, the, the way that I did drugs, I, I let that over, overtake everything. I couldn't hold a job. I didn't give a fuck about my family. Right. I could never have been, I was never a functioning drug addict, you know? So yeah. like just that phrase is, uh, it's weird. You know what I mean? It's a weird yeah. phrase it's because if you're not, it's so hard to imagine what that is. You know what yeah. I mean? And your mom obviously yeah. pulled it off. When did you, uh, when did you figure out that you, you might love getting high a little too much? Um, so I, it was maybe my, my late teens where I, I really loved smoking weed though. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't just the, the high, it wasn't just the smoking. It, it was the whole, the, the whole culture of smoking weed, you know, and, totally. um, and, and this, and this was a time where like, I just graduated high school uh, I, I was thinking about taking a year off uh, before I went to college and we were going around Connecticut, going to all this, all the colleges for all their parties, you know, and, and then I, I started to be the one that was supplying these parties with fucking huge bags of weed. And um, I just loved the feeling of people needing me to supply these parties. So eventually I went from selling weed to selling Molly to selling ecstasy um, to eventually selling nitrous, you know, and I just love that feeling of just being how needed. Much, how much, how much nitrous did you sell? Um, so it got to a point where I had a, uh, uh, a little, I want to say it was a 20, 25 pound tank. And, uh, we had this, we had this, uh, um, this crooked dentist from Boston that, yes. would, re- that would refill our tank and yes. I would, and I would just go around um, colleges and I would sell balloons for $5, ice cold fatties, medical yes. grade yes. for $5, you know, now we're talking. Yeah. 
And, and then and then it got to the point where like we're following festivals, we're following fish around, we're following uh, Phil Lesh around and we're posting up in these parking lots. And I'm just walking, walking through the, the parking lots with balloons in each one of my fingers and screaming ice cold fatties, get your yes. ice cold fatties, you know, and and. and uh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that that, I love that. Uh, it, oh, dude, I loved it. I, and but there was a there was a summer where I was just doing so much nitrous that I, it's, <laughs> it's it couldn't have been good for me, you know. Like I was I was doing a lot of fucking nitrous. So were you part of the nitrous mafia? The yeah. nitrous mafia? No, no. I, I've heard of them. Um, I, I I I even I was even at, at a I, I want to say it was a Dave Matthews show in Hartford, Connecticut where somebody got killed in the parking lot because they were selling nitrous on the wrong side of the parking lot and the body got dumped in the woods. I don't fucking know. I don't fucking, I didn't, at that point, I didn't even know the nitrous mafia was a thing. And then I'm just like going around the parking lot, screaming ice cold fatties. So like, and I had no idea that this was a thing. And then like a couple days later, I I see this on the news and I'm like, what the fuck? The nitrous mafia and I'm finding out they're I like, love that. yeah, and, and, and then I'm finding out that the way that they're getting all their tanks in is like uh, days before the festival, they would scuba dive because the festival was on the, uh, was on the, on the coast. So they would scuba dive their tanks from boats and then at night go up on the beach and, and, uh, and bury their tanks. <laughs> yeah. Scuba dive. They would scuba dive with. I mean, this is me having fun for a second, but would yeah, they yeah, scuba yeah. dive with an oxygen tank and a nitrous tank on yeah. their back so they could <laughs> yeah. camouflage the nitrous? Yeah, yeah. I love that. That's yep. amazing. I love nitrous. I still yeah. love nitrous. Um, I like, I like. I had a guy offer to do. I have to fucking go to the dentist. My teeth are all fucked up. And I yeah. had a dopey listener. It was like, my dad's a dentist. He'll do whatever. And I call him up, and he like. He's in some like kind of hoodie spot or something. And I was like, well, will you give me nitrous? And he's like, I'm not sure if I will. And I was like, fuck it. I'll just pay to go to the dentist because I don't want to go without the nitrous. <laughs> yeah. You know, do you, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're three years sober. Have you been to the dentist? Um, I haven't. <laughs> not, not yet. It's uh, that's something that I've been procrastinating about. Uh, um, I'm not, I'm not afraid of a lot of a lot of things on this earth, but the dentist is one of them. And, uh, I've just, wow. I've been procrastinating. I, I need to. That's so funny. I'm going to go to the dentist and be like, can I get an ice cold fatty before we start? <laughs> <laughs> Please. Yeah. That's going to be the thing. Um, so like, and, and when you were selling bud, were you selling good bud? Like what were the, like, yeah. what were the like so where would you get good bud from? And, and were you selling so good I'm, acid and good ecstasy? Were you like, yeah. like front of good drugs? Oh yeah. So, um, the acid, we, I just r- randomly, and this was back when they had, uh, um, CD stores and record stores and they, I, I just randomly bumped into this girl who like looked, she looked like a, like a hippie, you know? And then we just started talking and she's like, yeah, I, I have a, a really good LSD connect and, uh, we're like, Oh dope. Like, well, what's up? And then we start, we, we, we made this uh, um, really good relationship with this crew from uh, Manhattan and they were calling it the family fluff and they were giving us fucking, they were giving us sheets for pennies on the dollar yes. and it was, and it was some of the best LSD I've ever fucking had in my life. You know, it was very clean. It was very it, it, like you, you only needed one tab, you know, like nowadays I'm hearing kids tell stories like, oh, I took six tabs of LSD. I'm like, what? That must have been garbage. You know, <laughs> that's like, so funny. So, <laughs> I, so like, was it just white blotter? Yeah, just white blotter. Yep. From yep. Manhattan, the family fluff. When we were in when we were in treatment, I had a roommate in treatment and he's like dream dopey guest to me. And I never he like disappeared. I never heard from him again. He was this guy. He didn't look like a hippie, but he was a hippie. Right. His name was yeah. Don. And um he was involved with, he would always call it Grateful Dead family acid. Like he was involved uh-huh. with some, and I, I, you know, I'm a great Grateful Dead fan. I love the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Um, but uh, I never was so in the scene that I knew anybody that made acid and whatever. I had a, like I had Bill Kreutzmann's son on Dopey and I had the Dead's old manager, Sam Cutler on Dopey. Wow, but like I was, awesome. I, he wasn't that good of a guest, but yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> it was cool. It was, it was, it wasn't as good as I, as I had hoped it would be. Um, yeah. Actually, Chris was still alive when, when I made the episode and he was like, dude, 
this is terrible. He was, yeah. he was upset that I had done it. But anyway, the point is like, where did, wait, do you, what, what's the backstory behind the acid you would get the family fluff? It was, so I used to party with my mom a lot. Like I would smoke weed with her. I would take LSD with her. I would take ecstasy with her. My, like my mom is my best friend, you know, and still, and I, and I, it's still to, to, to this day, still, even though she drives me fucking nuts, um, she's still my best friend. I could talk to her about anything. And, and, and I think the reason, and I've done a lot of thinking about this and I, and I think the reason why she was like spoiling me and partying with me and wanted to be the cool mom. And she, she was more of a friend than a parent, you know, and letting me and all the, me and all the bros come party at our house. You know, my house was the hangout spot. And I, I think the reason that was, was because I think she felt bad about my father passing my sister running away. And I, th I think she just felt bad, you know, and she just wanted to make up for that. I, I maybe, maybe she felt responsible some way. I, I don't know. But so I, I would party with my mom a lot and that's how she, she was the one to introduce me to LSD. And, um, and it just, it, it came to a point where, and she was, she was the first one at the, um, it's saying our internet. We're talking, tell me about your, your uh, you and your mom. Like you were talking yeah. about it. And I was just going to ask, like, do you think it's because she was scared? She wanted to pull out all the stops because, you know, she didn't want to lose you. Yeah, that, that's what I think it is. And she she was the one that really taught me how to sell drugs too. Um, because it, it started off with me, just me and my mom smoking a lot. And, and I was fucking 14 or 15 at the time. And I had no money. So she was, she was the one that would be buying a half ounce or an ounce of weed a week or two, every two weeks and we would smoke it. And it got to the point where she was just spending too much money. So what she did was, uh, she bought me an ounce, she bought me a scale and she bought me those little, those little bags with the apples on it. And she, and she was like, okay, if, if you want to keep smoking weed, what you need to do is you need to bag this ounce up into grams. You need to sell them to your friends. You'll make money and you'll be able to smoke for free. So that was really the first taste of selling drugs that I got. And I, right. I, I fucking fell in love with it. You know, I, I loved the fact that I can get high for free. I love the fact that I'm making money and, and feeling wanted by all these people in town, you know? And at that point I was living in old Sabre, Connecticut. It's a very, um, small, rich, white neighborhood. And, um, and I stuck out like a sore thumb. The cops hated me. And when I, uh, when I turned 18, I got this huge settlement from my father passing when, um, for, uh, we, it was a lawsuit and it was, it was, my lawyers had control of it until I turned 18. So when I was 18, I got a few hundred thousand dollars. And when that happened, I just fucking went, I went crazy. Wow. A few hundred you know? thousand dollars. So like, walk me through that. Like you get yeah. a few hundred, does it come in a check? How many hundreds yeah. of thousands? $300,000? Yeah. It was a little over two. And okay. um, it, it it was a check. The day I turned 18, I had to go to to my lawyer's office. Oh my God. They, they give me a check for $200,000. But my mom was like, and I'm, I was planning on just going right to the bank. But my mom was like, no, you have to go to school. So I'm like, all right, fine. So I take the check with me to school and I'm just like bragging. I'm just like, look at this, look at this, look what I just got, you know, just being an asshole. And then I, I get out of school, go right to the bank. And first thing I do is like, all right, I want to cash this. And the, the, the bank teller, she, she's like looking at me, looking at the check, looking at me, looking at the check. And I'm like, yep, I want that in cash. That's me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and and she, she's just like, we can't just take out and give you this much money in cash. We don't even have this much in the bank. I'm like, okay, well, how, how much is it? How long is it going to take? She, uh, she's like, All right, a few days. So they call me back when they have it. They have two security guards waiting there for me. They give me all of it in cash in like a canvas looked like a pillowcase. And they're like, do you want the security guards to follow you home? I'm like, nope, I'm good. And so I drove home. I laid it all. I poured all of it out in my bed and I just laid in it for like two you hours. Did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did you get high before you laid in the money? No, no, I didn't. No. Nope. And, I, and <laughs> <laughs> the money got you high. <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. Money, money totally. Dude, how disappointing is it though? 
that the bank doesn't have two hundred thousand dollars in it. It's like we dream. There's like a safe and bags yeah. of money and yeah. gold someplace, and and they don't have money to cash your fucking settlement check. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the worst? Yeah, it, 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 that that was really surprising. And um, but it, it like giving a kid that much money, like after growing up poor eighteen years, the first eighteen years of his life, you know. Um, I'm not blaming it on anybody, but <laughs> like it's it's not really a good move <laughs> given given an 18 year old well, that much fucking terrible. money. Well, what do you, what's the worst move? Giving a kid two hundred thousand dollars on his 18th birthday, or giving a kid a hundred dime bags with apples on it and say, if you want to smoke <laughs> weed, this is how you do it. Which yeah. which is worse? Don't tell me. You know. Yeah, that's, that's so true. true. Yeah. You know, or or yeah. how about I mean, like we skipped over the biggest question of all: what's tripping with your mother like? <laughs> you know i mean it's like come on yeah it's um it was it was fun it was weird um there were there would be some times where she was like like tripping really fucking hard she would have this picture of my father on top of the tv oh god yeah and i like i like we would both eat it we'd hang out for a little bit and then i'd go hang out with the, with the bros and i'd come back a couple hours later and she would just be on her knees with the TV off, just staring at my, my, my father's picture. And I'm just like, mom, what the fuck are you doing? And she goes, Oh, your father's talking to me. She's like, what dude? <laughs> like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> like I, I gotta go. <laughs> like, I love you, but I gotta go. <laughs> I would avoid my mother, like the plague on acid. I remember I'd come home from something <laughs> and I'd be tripping and like, I'd be too loud and she'd be screaming and I'd be just, you know the worst but yeah. like that's got to be super heavy but it's also very beautiful you know what i mean like yeah. the fact yeah. that you were willing to do it you know i can make fun of it but the fact that yeah. you were willing to do it says how close you guys were yeah yeah it me and my mom were super close you know I, even like when when i first the very first time i smoked weed i felt like i was i i felt like i had to tell her you know, I, I felt like, oh, oh my God, I, I smoked weed. My mom's going to be mad, you know? And so, but, but I told her and she was like, hey, smoke all the weed you want. Just don't put anything up your nose or in your arm. It's like, all right, cool. You know? And then I, I kind of, I kind of ran with that. And, um, when you got the 200 grand, mm -hmm. had you been dealing for a while at that point? Were you used yep. to a bunch of money? Like yep. you were, I mean, like what was, how much, what was the most money you had seen prior to the 200 grand? Prior to the 200 grand, maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 grand. Right. Which is still a lot of money to be a kid yeah. selling drugs. Like I used yeah. to sell drugs. I never saw any fucking money. I would just yeah. do the drugs. I would fuck it up. You know what I mean? I was mm -hmm. terrible at it. Um, yeah. But uh, so when you get the 200 grand, what do you do with it? Uh, the first thing I do is I go buy a, uh, a Chrysler 300 right off the lot. <laughs> <laughs> And I put Lamborghini doors on it. Okay. I bought, tw I bought 22 inch rims. Okay. Um, I, TVs all inside of it. My, my sound, wow. my sound, I spent 10 grand on my sound system and I was an asshole. You know, I, I, my, like I said, my town hated me. I would, I would, I would drive down main street, this really small street. I, I would drive down there with my doors up, blasting rap music, you know, just really flaunting being an asshole. You know, well, and, yeah, uh, you were, you were living the life, you know, it's like a yeah, video for, for real. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then, and then I go to my weed dealer and I'm like, all right, I want a couple pounds, you know, and then I, I, I buy that and I, I buy a bunch of uh, ecstasy and I buy, I, I buy all the toys that I wanted. I had quads, you know, uh, jet skis. And okay. So you just buy everything. Yeah. Do you, do, are you like, I'm done selling drugs or do you buy drugs too? Oh no. I, oh no. I buy I buy more drugs, you know, it, it, it got to the point where, you know, like I start, okay, I, I'm smoking and then I start drinking, I'm partying at colleges and then like the ecstasy comes in and then LSD comes in and Molly comes in and then all of a sudden you're mixing fucking your candy flipping and then you're mixing all three and then you're doing all three while you're drinking and smoking and then you're doing all that while you're driving and, and traveling the fucking country and and doing all that. And, and I, I had only planned to take one year off before I went to college. And, um, 
before I went to college, I got my wisdom teeth taken out and that's how opiates came into the picture. Right. I was, I was very, very against opiates because I saw what it did to my mom. I, 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 I started to see what it was doing to a few of my friends. I have, I have an uncle that's a heroin addict. I saw what it did to him. So I was mother's brother, your mother's brother. No, my, my father's brother. Yep. And, and so I was so against it. And um, when I got my wisdom teeth taken out, they, the, the dentist only gave me, I, I want to say they were like Vicodin fives or something. And it wasn't doing anything for the pain. I was literally in my bed crying from the pain. And I had a, a friend over at that, that night and he, he was selling Perk 30s at the time. And he was like, he, he's like, here, man, I won't even charge you. Just eat it. You know? So I was like, you know what? Fine. I'm in so much pain. Fuck it. So I ate, I ate one Perk 30, it knocked me out, put me to sleep. I woke up feeling fucking amazing and I was like, holy shit, I like that. Let me get a couple more. And I I was able to really, it was like a schedule. It was every Thursday night when um, the the show uh, Robin Big was on. Remember that show? Robin Big and then the Fantasy Factory. It was a new episode was on every Thursday. So I I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to treat myself every Thursday when that show comes on. So I was doing it like that. And then eventually it became every Thursday and Friday and then every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then eventually every fucking day. And then oxys came into the picture. And then uh, I learned, and at this point I'm only snorting them. And then I learned from an MTV show, True Life, I'm an Addict, that you could could smoke them. So that's how I started smoking them. And then- How did you smoke them? You you just put a pill on 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 a piece of tin foil. And you chase right, the, chase right. the dragon. Okay. Yeah. You didn't have any kind of technique to smoking pills. Oh, pills no, 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 no. What I wanted to ask you is when you're selling all the drugs on uh-huh. fish tour, or dead tour, were you on fish tour? Um, yep. Fish tour. Um, and then we were following Phil Lesh, uh, Phil Lesh and friends for a little bit. Did um, you like that music? I did. Um, that's the kind of music that I grew up on. Um, my mom would always, um, play either um, she had she had all of her all of her records and her record player and she, and she would play either Pink Floyd Led Zeppelin. You're set up in Texas with your studio. Yep, I'm in Texas right now. I just moved here from uh, I was living in Los Angeles for uh, four years and and I was living in a sober living those whole four years and um, or three years in the sober living and um, when I quit my job I, I I worked in the same sober living that uh, I was living in. And when I quit and I was comfortable financially, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to travel the country. I packed everything in my fucking Lexus, drove around the country for seven weeks and decided what my next move was. And I was like, fuck it. I want to continue entertaining people. And um, my team and I have a little, a small following, you know, but so I I decided I'm going to buy a ranch and just continue filming and nobody will fuck with us, you know? Dude, no. you're jumping way ahead, way ahead in the story. It's my own <laughs> fault. But, like, did you buy the ranch with, with money that you had inherited? Where do you have the money for the oh, fucking no, ranch? No, no, How do you no, make no, so no. much money? What are you doing, Vinny? What's going um, so, on with you? <laughs> so when I was working in, um, in treatment while living there, I didn't have to pay rent for three years. So I was able to, the money that I was making, I was able to really pocket and save, which, which I was never, never good at. You know? Dude, but let's not skip. The, I don't want to ruin your yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I, yeah, I, I don't yeah. want to ruin your story. Your yeah. mother was a hippie motorcycle chick. You yep. got raised in the hippie spirit. You're yep. on tour. The question is, you know, like if you're on tour with Fish and, and Phil and Friends and all that stuff, it's yeah. like there are pills in the lot. There is a little oh, yeah. bit of dope, but there is a lot of pills. Like, but it didn't, it didn't show up for you. Why? Like you yeah. avoided it because of your mom. Was that like a choice? Like yeah. Um, it, it was, I, I guess it was a choice. And, and like my, my main circle of friends, we, we were strictly weed and hallucinogens, you know, and, and nitrous, you know? Um, Curious. yeah. And, and it was just because it was fun, you know, just like we grew up on a beach town and we would just eat a bunch of acid and mushrooms and go fucking walk on the beach, you know? And, and, um, so it was just a lot of fun. And, um, and then as the, the years went by, like all of our other friends were getting into the perks and oxys. So we kind of separated ourselves from them and did our own thing. But then 
very, very slow. The opiates didn't come into the picture for us until I was 21. And, um, and then it just was, it just went fucking batshit crazy, dude. Like the quickest progression of gnarliness and just well, in the up. first place, if your mother's like, don't, I don't want to see you shooting anything. And I don't yeah. want to see you snorting anything. Is that yeah. why you were like, okay, I can smoke Oxycontin? Yeah, no, that, uh, <laughs> I, um, I, I don't know. I, I think I, I was, at, at, when I started smoking them, I would, I had already been doing them, snorting them for, I don't know, maybe a few months. And I, I just love getting high so much. I'm always looking for that next best high, you know, and, and smoking mm -hmm. them, smoking them. You get, you, you get the way personally, I feel like you get higher, but the high doesn't last as long. If that makes any sense. Of course. I mean, I, I mean, when I smoked heroin, it was like, why am I doing this? You know, yeah. it's like, it just yeah. doesn't hit. It doesn't, doesn't maintain. It doesn't hit. And I lost so much smoke. Um, I, I came up like a huge fan of rock and roll and a huge fan mm -hmm. of like out, outlaw culture and, and beatnik mm -hmm. culture and artist culture and all that stuff. And yeah. I knew that heroin was out there. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and I, I never wanted to do heroin. You know what I mean? It was not yeah. on my agenda but I was at art school and I tried it and I still was like, I'm a stoner. I don't want to mess with that shit. And then yeah. th the next time I did it, it just hit me right where it, you know, in that spot, like it hit me yeah. in a spot where it worked too well. Like, yep. did it hit you there right away? It was right away. As, as soon as, <sighs> are you talking about opiates in general or heroin? Well, we'll, we'll deal with, op I mean, I think it's all the same, right? It, it is. It is all the same. I didn't start with pills. I started with heroin. So I oh, didn't okay. have to build, build up to it. Like yeah. I wound up having to do pills later if I couldn't get dope, but it was mostly like my, my addiction was mostly all heroin, you know, and yeah. then benzos. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. I didn't have the build. So I would imagine that if you're doing perk thirties before you're doing heroin, you get kind of a similar good feeling, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and it was, it was fucking instant, man. It was the, the first time I put, I, I swallowed a perk 30, I felt this sense of, um, it was the sense of warmth and, and somebody, I forget who it was, but somebody said it in a way that made so much fucking sense. It, he said it was like, it was like having the warmest blanket on during the coldest night. Mm. And when he said that, I was like, holy fuck, that's so true. Because I, I felt this sense of warmth and this sense of security and this sense of, holy fuck, I finally found what I have been looking for my whole life, you know? And I was like, this is, I, I'm going to be doing this my whole life. I, it was like that instant. I was like, oh, I found what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. And I, and I ran with it. And, and with me selling drugs for so long, I, that was my next thing. And especially in New England, like you get all the, you get all the drugs from the city and bring it to the outer states. You, the profit margin is insane. So I, I, I found a connect in Staten Island for Percocets and I, I would get them for fucking $15 a piece, sometimes 12. And I would go to Connecticut and sell them for 30, you know? So I'm doubling my money and I'm doing as many as I want for fucking free, you know? And, and it began, it be, became this fucking every two or three days I'm going to Staten Island, picking up a couple hundred of them and bringing them back to Connecticut. And it, it just got, it, it got really bad. My house got raided a few times and it, uh, and, and then like all of a sudden I'm becoming my best customer and I'm not making any money. I'm just making enough to re up, you know, and then now I'm fucking not making enough to re up and I'm selling all the toys that I, I have purchased with that money that I got. And I'm selling, I, I had all this jewelry. I'm selling my jewelry one piece at a time. I'm selling my jet skis. I'm selling my quads. I'm selling my, I had fucking a hundred pairs of Jordans. I was selling, you know, like one by one, I'm selling everything that I owned and the very, <laughs> to, to skip forward just a little bit. The last thing that I had from that money that I got when I was 18 was I, I also purchased a 2008 Dodge Magnum with the Hemi and I purchased it for, I bought it off the lot for like 42,000 and I sold it to my drug dealer for two ounces of crack, 
a hundred perk thirties and fifteen hundred dollars cash. And that was the Not last thing that. I, oh no, good deal, right? no. Right. And, and my and my sick fucking twisted thinking was, okay, I'm gonna smoke a little bit of the crack, sell the rest, do a few of the of the thirties, sell the rest, and then with that fifteen hundred dollars and the money that I make off of selling, I'll, I'll buy another car. Right. You know. But I was locked in a hotel room in Brantford, Connecticut, and I smoked all the crack, did all the 30s, and then I spent the $1,500 that he gave me. So now I have nothing. I'm living in a hotel. You know? It's, um, looking back at it now, like, I, I don't regret anything, and I don't, like, yeah, I wish I could have done, I did things differently, but. Dude, you're sitting in a beautiful room with a neon sign that says moist cheeks with a leopard skin <laughs> bucket hat. What do you have to regret anything for? It's know, working know. out. You yeah. know, like you don't have yeah. to, you know. Yeah. Thank God you survived. You know what I mean? Yeah. What was the first time you did um you did heroin? Like how did that pop in? Um the first time I did heroin. So my my best friend who is now not with us anymore, he passed away from an overdose um a few years ago. He lived in Burlington, Vermont. And he knew that I was struggling. And he offered, uh, at the time I was homeless, couch surfing, and he offered me to come live on his couch for a while so he could help detox me and get me clean. So I, I took that offer and I go to Vermont and I'm sleeping on his couch. I'm going through the fucking withdrawals for a few days. and But I, not knowing, this dude is fucking doing heroin in the bathroom, you know? Oh my and God. I, yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I see him going in the bathroom all these fucking times, and I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? And I realize what he's doing, and I'm just like, dude, give me some now. And then that's how heroin is. Hold, hold, hold up, hold up, hold up. He, you, you're struggling with drugs. You're struggling with yeah. opiates. Yeah. He says, come up to my house in Burlington, and you can kick here. Yeah. Okay, that's what he says. Meanwhile, yeah. he's a heroin addict <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a habit, right? Yeah. And so it's like, I've never, I've never heard, I've been doing this show for fucking almost six years. I'm a heroin addict. I've never heard a story like this in my life. Yeah. And you didn't know, had you been using Perk 30s and Oxys with him? No. Nope. You grew up nope. with him? John. I grew up. So yeah. My friend, John. Yep. And it was me, John and Tom. Tom's my now manager. And I think Tom he, wrote Dopey months ago about you. And uh -huh. I didn't know anything. And I was like, hey, who cares? Skinny Vinny, what the fuck? So, yeah, it's, like, it's like, I don't know. Um, but uh, it was great. Anyway, so uh, so what? The, how could this have happened? Like this story, like how does that happen? Yeah, so so me, Tom, and John, we were the ones that was the, it was us that were, uh, when I was talking about the hallucinogens and smoking and all that stuff. And when I started getting into the Percocets and the opiates, they kind of faded away for me. They were, they were my best friends, my family. Like they were more family to me than my actual family. But when I started getting into the dark shit, they started fading away very slowly. And then Tom went to school up in Massachusetts. John moved to uh, Vermont and I was still in Connecticut, just running the streets, you know? And so we didn't really talk. We didn't really stay in contact that much. And then when, when John found out that I was really struggling and this was after I tried going to college down in Florida, um, I, I only lasted a few months, you know, and then I tried going to school in Connecticut to be a truck driver that only lasted a couple months, you know, and, um, he, he reached out and he's like, Hey man, I heard you're, you don't have a, a place to stay and you're struggling. And he offered me to come sleep on his couch. But he didn't know that you had this habit and that you'd be kicking. No, no, no he knew. He definitely knew. So crazy. So yeah. it's like, you're, so it's like, all right, dude, here, here's some soup. Here's, here's some cigarettes. Hang out. I'm just going to go to the bathroom now. It's like, all right, man. All right, dude. Here's it. I hope you're doing okay. I'm just going to go to the bathroom. How many yeah. times did he, did he use before? Was he shooting or snorting? He, uh, he, he was snorting at this, at this time. And so at, how long did it take for you to catch on? Maybe a week. Oh my God. You're kicking yeah. in his house for a week. What yeah. is he doing to keep the, the habit flowing? Uh, he, so, <laughs> this was around the time Silk Road was a big thing and Bitcoin were, was, yeah. and Bitcoin was only fucking $80 a coin, you uh -huh. know? So he, he, he was a computer genius. Anything technical, okay. he was a fucking genius. He was, uh, he was a chemist. Like he was just so fucking smart. 
And he, he made, he had this hustle with Bitcoin back in the day. And he was, that's where he was making all of his money. And that's where he, and in Vermont, it's hard to get drugs like that. So he was ordering everything off Silk Road and he would just have the dope come right to the fucking front door. It was insane. And yeah, it was, it was, it was insane. And because, and this is going to lead into another uh, crazy fucking story is like, we were, when I, when I found out he was doing dope and I was like, all right, give me some. Then I, I'm living with him up there for months and we're buying all this top notch, top grade fucking heroin off Silk Road. It's probably to this day, some of the best shit that I've ever had. And literally gets delivered right to our front doorstep because in Vermont, how it works is the farther north you go, closest to the Canadian border, the more expensive drugs get. A bundle of heroin in New York City, 25 bucks, you know, at, at, the, at this point in time, 25 bucks. Burlington, Vermont. Only if you buy a shitload of it. Shitload yeah, of it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Continue. Yeah. Burlington, Vermont, you're paying $200 a bundle. For the $25 bundle. For, bundle. for a 25 that, you, that, that you're buying like a shitload of bundles. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, would, I would never go to okay. the city and just buy a fucking couple bundles. You know, when I go to the city, I go to fucking make sure I'm good for a while. So how many you know? bundles would you buy? Every time I would go to the city before I was involved in a major fucking thing, um, I don't know, maybe 30, you know, maybe somewhere from 20 to 30. Um, that's it wouldn't where you, last that's me where you say that's where you save in the bulk. I have, I have so many questions, yeah. Vinny. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's right. like, yeah, no, it's you, okay. you never saw, you ever saw, um, I'm sure you've seen Pulp Fiction, right? Of course. Right? In that scene where he's like, this is the Mexican shit and whatever. Yeah. And then there's like, and yeah, this yeah, is yeah. The, the Choco or whatever. Yeah. Right? It's like, <laughs> yeah. okay. I use drugs in Manhattan. You know what I mean? Like I use drugs in this room. I use drugs where I live down the street. And I would uh-huh. go to Brooklyn or I'd have a dealer come or I'd go to the Lower East Side or whatever. And the yeah. good drugs was called, you know, dead on arrival or monster power or uh, bush yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But it uh-huh. wasn't like the Choco from Central America, you know. So yeah. when you're buying this high grade heroin on Silk Road, is it like the bullshit stamps or is it like the fucking oh, no, fiction there's, shit? No, you know? there's there's no stamps. When you're when you're buying it off Silk Road, you get it in a in a bag. All in just one bag. It's not bagged like up. Eric fucking, like Eric Stoltz. Yeah, thing, yeah. Yeah. What did they call it? There's no name. They, they, they have no name okay. for it. Yeah. And and it, okay. and it was lit, like, we were buying off Silk Road. We were buying heroin. We were buying uh, um, vials of liquid LSD. We were buying Benz. Ah. We were buying Benzo powder. Like strictly. Benzo we, we, powder. We, yeah. We, we were strictly, we were making our own Xanax. You know, and like, and we don't know how much, like how much powder is a fucking milligram. So we are just like doing this and we're, we're blacked out for, for fucking weeks at a time. You're pressing because your own pills or you're not, not pressing. We put it in, 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 yeah, in little caps. Yeah. Amazing. This is dude. And I never got to do liquid LSD either. You've done everything that I didn't get to do. I, I used, so. it got to a point where I was shooting up liquid LSD. Cold. Did you put it in your eyes? I, I never did that. No, you never put it. No. Okay. But you would shoot no. it. So tell us yeah. a story, you know, and, and, you know, feel free just to tell stories. Cause I, yeah. This yeah, is yeah, the yeah. greatest thing I've ever heard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so funny. It's like, why, why should I enjoy this so much? You know what I mean? Like yeah. you know, I'm, yeah. I'm coming up on six years in recovery. Thank God. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. But it's like, why, like, this is making my day. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know what I mean? yeah, like, yeah. And, and I'll to tell you this, Vinny, I'm going to say this and I don't mean to be up your butt. But yeah. like we need, we needed you. The dopey nation needed you to come. This is like one of those things where there are no coincidences. Uh-huh. We needed you, and you've arrived. Now tell yeah. us about <laughs> shooting liquid LSD, please. I, I I love shooting shit in my arm. I love I love the whole the the whole ritual of it, the whole process, the the feeling of the needle going in, seeing the blood go back up the needle before you push down. I love it. Yes. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. whatever the fuck you could put in a needle, I'm doing it. I don't care. Mm-hmm. And uh, it got to the point where like we would just order fucking liquid LSD and, and it just dawned on me. I was like, huh, I'm going to try shooting it. Instant. I'm talking before the needle goes all the way down or the plunger goes all the way down. I'm out of this Full one. on. Full on. And there was one, there was one instance where 
I was, tri- I, I was so fucked up where it was, om- it was almost uncomfortable. And I was on the couch and this girl was sitting next to me and I was like, I was sweating. I, I was like having, almost having a bad trip. She notices that I'm like really going through it. And all of a sudden she just gets on top of me and starts making out with me. And it calmed me down. I was like, I was like, holy shit. That's cool. Let's keep doing this. And that girl ended up being my fiance or my ex fiance like a year later. <laughs> was she you know, a stranger? She, was she a stranger when she did not that? A str- not a stranger. Like we had been partying um, a, a little bit together for like a couple weeks, you know? And, uh, and she's also, she was, she became my running partner and like we would do heroin together and, you know, but that's a, that's a serious love moment when you oh, shot I, up I, liquid LSD <laughs> and you're, and, and you're a junkie and this girl gets on top of you and start making yeah. out, you're going to fall. Yeah. There's no way not to fall. Exactly. And, and the first, uh, this is, this is funny. It's also kind of disgusting, but the first time that we had sex, um, we were both we were both high on heroin and she wanted me to put it up her butt. <laughs> and so I put, she starts, she starts riding me like, and, I, and I'm in her butt and all of a sudden I start smelling shit. Yes. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm covered in shit and she got all embarrassed and ran to the bathroom, got in the shower. She's crying and I'm like, oh, I, I, I think I love this girl. So I just go, I, I just run in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just, so I run in the bathroom and I'm just like, Listen, look, it's okay. Don't, don't be embarrassed. You know, I got in a shower with her, you know, like, and, and then, and then we were together for a while after that. <laughs> Let me ask you some questions here. Okay. First of all, like, I cannot, I just, if I haven't thanked you enough, Thank yeah. you so much for coming on the show. Because yeah. this is like just my, it's my it's the best. Number one, so thank you. Okay. Yeah. Now number two, I I had I didn't have a lot of anal sex in my life. I had uh-huh. a little bit of anal sex. I would always yep. get nervous. It made me nervous. Yeah. The, t- the tenderness. It's like whatever. Um, yeah. But what everyone would say, and I, as though I would act as though I knew about anal sex, was that the shit will come out, you know, and, and the shit didn't come out when I had anal sex. It was, it was, I was worried that I would tear her anus or whatever. Yeah. Now, how often have you had anal sex in your life? Quite a few, quite a few times. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, uh, I don't know. Maybe like 20, 30 times. Okay. With like, so maybe, fair maybe, maybe, yeah. Maybe with, but with like 10 different girls, how often, is the shit coming out that it was, that was the only time one time, one of my, my one best time. friend, probably my, my, probably my best friend in the world when yeah. he was, he was, he's not as good looking now as he was when we were kids, when we were kids, he was just the best looking kid in the world. Yeah. And, uh, and he would, he wouldn't have sex with women in their vaginas. He would uh-huh. only fuck them in the ass. And I never asked him about the shit. Um, <laughs> But he was like the maestro. He needed to fuck everyone in the ass. But anyway, yeah. so so when 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 this when your ex fiance, how is she doing now? By the way, is she around? Um, she she's around. Um, the the last time I saw her, so so we split up because we we went through some shit when we were when we were together up in Vermont. We went through a lot of shit together, like really bad, a lot of bad stuff, like a lot of deaths, a lot of a lot of police, a lot of um, me living in her parents' house and taking advantage of that. And, um, and then we, we split up. Well, I went to a rehab. She comes from money. So her parents sent her to a very expensive private place in New Hampshire. And I, I ended up going to a state run place in Vermont and she ended up, uh, she ended up meeting some dude in the rehab that she went in, that she went to. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and then when I got out, I did 30 days in a spot. It was, I think it was Brattleboro, Vermont. And, um, the day I get out, you know, they give you your phone back, give you all your stuff back. And I'm in the parking lot. I turn my phone on and my phone's just blowing up. And I I answer it. They're like, yo, John overdosed. He's in critical condition up in, in, uh, Burlington. So I fucking fly up to Burlington and, um, I get to the hospital, get to the front desk. I'm like, I'm like, listen, I'm looking for John Randall. Uh, somebody just called me, he's in critical condition and they're looking through the computer and they're like, we, we don't have a John Randall here. 
And I'm like, no, 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 that's bullshit. He's here. And then they do a little bit more digging in the computer. And that's when she, she was like, I'm so sorry, but he just passed 10 minutes ago. So I, that kind of, after hearing about the girl and then this happening, me being 10 minutes too late, it just, it, it threw me off the deep end. And I went and I, I bought a bunch of heroin, went back to the um, parking lot of the hospital and I overdosed in the parking lot in the car and a stranger just happened to walk by and just by the grace of God had fucking Narcan on him and Narcan found, saw me with the needle still in my arm and Narcan me. How old were you at that point? I want to say I was 25. And that's how old John was when he died. Uh, I, I think he, he, if he, he might've been 25. Yep. 25 or 26. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry to hear about him dying. It's Thank like, you. uh, Thank you. It's it, and, know, and that's the, that, that's the kind of thing. And, and even to this day, and I know it's, I, I shouldn't be thinking this way, but I, I kind of have um, what they call a, a survivor's guilt because mm. I, I have over 15 overdoses on my belt and a, a few of them where I like had a tube down my throat, EMTs over me while I'm waking up. And I have done a lot of bad things in my past. A lot of bad things. Randall, John, John was the sweetest kid. Wouldn't hurt a fucking fly. And he had one overdose that took him out. Yeah, but it's like, you can't look at it like that. I, I know. I, could, yeah. I mean, you just can't. You can't. I mean, it, it sucks. I mean, it, it's like, um, like Chris probably overdosed a million times and he didn't think he could die and he died. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and before Chris died, uh, my, one of my best friends who I used with, like you used with John, my friend Todd, he died six weeks before Chris died. And he probably never overdosed before. He wasn't the sweetest guy in the world. And he was, certainly wasn't the smartest guy in the world. He was no yeah. John Randall, but I loved yeah. this guy. I loved him yeah. to death. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's weird. You know, there's no way to really talk about it and and really make sense of this thing that we do to get out of our heads to yeah. feel better, whatever, it, it's also deadly. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a hard duality. It's very hard to make sense of, of that kind of thing. You know, Absolutely. so like we, especially when we're telling stories about shooting LSD and our ex fiance <laughs> shitting on us, it's like, yeah. that's the fun part. And then, and yeah. then right around the corner is this, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, and I appreciate, you know, I had a million other questions about the, the anal sex and the shitting, but I appreciate <laughs> the, the point is more important that, that we can have fun. And, and like I used to, me and Chris, when we were doing the show, I used to say, we laugh, the survivors laugh, mm -hmm. right? That's what I we like would, that. that's what I would say. But then yeah. he died and like, I don't have survivor's guilt. I have sadness. You know what I mean? I have sadness, and I have, yeah. sadness? And I have um, like the show changed. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the show changed. I couldn't just like, I mean, you came along. Thank God. Like we were in trouble <laughs> until you showed up. But, but the, the show, the show wasn't like, I mean, I think after Todd died, like Chris would tell me, we get emails from people and we get fucked up emails and Chris, Chris was using and yeah. I couldn't, and I couldn't laugh about him because Todd had just died. And like, yeah. and Chris died like a minute later and the show was forever changed, you know? Yeah. Um, but uh, I want to hear more about what happened to you. Um, you guys were so full throttle, you know what I mean? When, so you're getting, you're, when you're getting, you know, the Silk Road drugs and like John would yeah. have been like a billionaire off of Bitcoin by now, right? When, right? He, when he passed, he had nine Bitcoins in his wallet. Wow. Yeah. So what happened to them? I don't know. I don't know. You know, some dopey fucking dopey fan gave me and Chris 200 bucks in Bitcoin. Uh, you know, wow. in, 20, in 2016 or something, yeah. 2015. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know what happened to it. It's gone. <laughs> you know, I don't think it's nine Bitcoins. I think it, it's yeah. worth, it's worth something, but yeah. Um, so like you guys are full throttle. Um, yeah. and does like, you don't have a big arrest in your story though, right? There isn't some major bust. There isn't years of prison. Time. So back in Connecticut, my, my house did get raided a few times, um, just from people, uh, ratting on me or, um, pretty much just people were adding on me. Uh, like people would get arrested and they would say, Oh, I got it from him. And his house is the, is the, where they manufacture it, you know, all this crazy shit. 
Um, so my house, I, I do have some, some felony arrests on my, on my record. Um, but the, the biggest, I, I was in, I was involved and this was up in, in Burlington before John passed. When, when I met that, my ex fiance and I started living with her, we were tired of, of, of spending fucking $200 for every time we wanted to buy a bundle, you know? And so a, a very good quality that I think I have is networking and building relationships. And so I, I became really good friends with the, uh, with the deal, with the dealers in, in Burlington. And what they were doing is they were running for this huge gang out of, and they were, they were bringing a, um, a mule back and forth from every few days. Right. And eventually I became that person to where I was picking up a mule from every four days. And this guy would have $250,000 worth of heroin in his backpack, maybe, maybe $50,000 worth of bagged up crack and a little bit of powder Coke. And he would have his gun. And I, and I was doing this every four days. I never met, I, I, I would have all these burner phones and I would be talking to the, the two bosses. Don't know them by their first name. They went by, one went by, the other went by. And I became very personal with these two guys, you know? And I eventually became just the driver, picking, go, driving six hours, picking them up, bringing them back to Burlington, to eventually being um, the one who was running around town, making, making sales. And then I became both. And... I was doing this every three or four days and I'm talking millions of dollars that I was bringing back and forth to these fucking dudes and and one and it got to a point where we were making so much fucking money that the local drug dealers in Burlington started to get mad because they couldn't touch our prices. So one morning I'm I'm asleep on the couch and I hear a glass break. And I thought it was just one of our roommates arguing with his girlfriend. So I didn't think anything of it. And then all of a sudden I see the, the curtain pull and they're like, get down on the ground or I'm going to shoot your ass. So it's six, it's six local dealers from Burlington with guns. They tie me up with Ziplocs and put a bag over my head. And we had a house where that we would sell out of the trap house and we would have a safe house where the dude would stay. And they knew what time the guy would come in the morning with a backpack so they tied us all up and they had us wait in this room while we were waiting for the guy with the backpack to show up. And <laughs> this is the craziest fucking part. I'm tied up. I'm zip tied. I have a bag over my head. I'm starting to get dope sick because I didn't get right yet that morning. And I'm starting to fucking shake. I'm starting to sweat. I'm starting to fucking dry heave. And the dude looks over at me. And he's like, what's wrong, white boy? I'm like, dude, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not feeling good, man. I need to get right. He go he cuts my zip ties, takes the bag off my head, pulls two bags out of his pocket. He's like, here you go. Let's me get right. And then ties me back up. Wow. Well, he's a gentleman. Yeah. I looked at him. I was like, I was like, you know what, man, you might be the nicest Jack boy I've ever met. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, Def right. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever yeah. talk to what happened then? So the, did, what, no, did, so, what happened? so, so the, the guy with the backpack came, they beat the shit out of him, took the backpack, robbed our house. They probably got like 60 grand in cash, 60 grand in heroin, um, a bunch of electronics and, uh, and never saw him again. So I call up the bosses, told them what happened. They're like, they're like, all right, I'll call you back in a few minutes. Three hours later, they're like, okay, we got another house for you. Sent us to another house that nobody knew about. These dudes were so well connected and had so much fucking money that they had another house in three hours for us to sell heroin out of. And they knew you were, you were trustable. Yeah. Yep. Like they knew yep. that it wasn't your play. Yep. Yep. And then we continued, oh. we continued this for nine months. And then the very last time I made the trip down, to pick the guy up. Granted when I, they told me to come down when I got there, they're like, we're not ready yet. They put me up in this fucking hotel on this shitbag hotel. They had me there for three days. Every morning, they're like, oh, we're not ready yet. We're not ready yet. So I'm waiting there for three days. But I have, I have no fucking money. I have no dope. And I'm like, listen, guys, I can't fucking stay here. I, I'm going to be dope sick. 
Every day they had somebody come to my room, give me, uh, grab me a couple other local heroin dealer guys' bags and like 50 bucks cash to go eat for the day. And they had me set, they had me sit up in that hotel for three or four days. And then they were finally ready. We could drive up back to Burlington. I'm out making, I'm out making runs. I get a call from one of my, uh, on the burner phones, feds, DA, everything are at all the houses. Don't come back. I threw out all my burner phones out the windows. I had maybe $1,500 cash on me, maybe three grand worth of heroin, a couple bags of crack and everything I owned, my, my, my computers, all my clothes, everything was at this house. Didn't look back. Fucking, I, I, I ran and I slept in my night, my 98 Ford Escort for like three months after that, all around Vermont. <laughs> did you try selling the dope or did you just live on it? Did oh, fuck no. It? I lived on it. No way would I want to sell that because I didn't know what was going to happen. So, I mean, in the beginning of this conversation, this magical conversation, <laughs> you, you started talking about being a homeless heroin addict who lived in a porta potty. Like, yeah. Was this the beginning of that? That was the beginning of that. So I, I was, I was living in my, and, and when I say living in my 98 Ford Escort, I was in the trunk, sleeping in no. the trunk. Imagine my fat ass sleeping in a tiny 98 Ford Escort, right? And then my- Dude, you, <laughs> your whole thing, it's like, it's like, it's so out there. And I didn't even mention- to the dopey nation, like who you are or what you do yeah. or your thing. Yeah. And I feel badly about that. They'll get to it. We'll, we'll get yeah. to it eventually. But like, dude, it's like, it's all fucking really next level stuff. You didn't do yeah. anything in a normal way. You know, no. you're sleeping in the trunk. So the trunk is closed when you're living. The there? trunk, the trunk is closed. And Can it was just, doors? Can you get it, it, out to the doors? First? Yeah. No. So I, I the, the, the doors worked. the front four doors worked, but in Vermont, it's illegal to be fucking either sleeping on the street or sleeping in your car, you know? So I had, I had nowhere else to go. So I would make sure that I would sleep in the trunk. So nobody saw me inside my trunk. How did you get out of it? They had, it has the, in, inside every trunk, there's the, the emergency, uh, uh, I've never slept in a trunk, so I don't know. Yeah. So they, they have this like a, a emergency pull handle in case somebody gets locked in somehow, you know, in that period, were you alone? Yeah. Uh, at, at that time, um, me and that girl, we stopped seeing each other. Randall had died. Um, I just, I was alone and I didn't know what to do. And, and I, I really thought I was either going to die or end up in prison. So I was just like going out guns blazing, you know? And, um, I was, and the tire of my Ford Escort popped and I didn't have the money to fix it. So I was parked. My, my car was parked in front of a house that their Wi-Fi wasn't locked and I still had my, 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 uh, my smartphone. So I, I made sure that I was still able to fucking watch Netflix, my mom's Netflix account while getting high in the right. trunk of my, tr of my Ford Escort. But living on that three grand of, of yeah, dope yeah, the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Did they have, yeah. was their Wi-Fi fire Wi-Fi or just standard sort of Wi-Fi? It was just standard, it was just standard okay. Wi-Fi. <laughs> it was like my dad, it was like my dad's <laughs> Wi-Fi. It yeah, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't fire Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, fuck man. And like, that must be where like, it, it's like, we can tell the story and it's an amazing story, but, uh, and laugh about it, but that must've been a very scary time. It was, it was very, it was very scary. And, and, and at this point, Tom, my, my manager, he, 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 he did some really fucked up shit in Connecticut where he ended up doing five years in federal prison. So at this, at this time he was locked up. Randall had passed. I'm on the streets and so it's like out of, out of the three of us, like I'm the only one that's still free, but I'm not living, you know, I'm surviving. And, um, and, and Tom didn't know the extent of what was going on because when Tom got locked up, like I was so fucked up that I wasn't writing. I wasn't, you know, um, he, he didn't know where to call, you know, like we, we didn't talk much. And, uh, and then when his, when Randall passed, his parents went in. And he saw the look on their faces and he, he thought that they were going to say that I died. Everybody, if you were to talk to anybody in our hometown, you, they would give you the answer. Yeah. We thought Vinny was going to be the one that was going to die first. Right. Right. And I can't, I can't feel guilty, but you, you just, you have to, I mean, that's something I hope you're working on. 
You know, I, I am you know working I mean? on like, that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's very hard because I did not have a very good reputation in town. Everybody knew me as the local drug dealer and I was a bad influence. So Randall's parents, even to this day, they're not too happy with me. And they, a, a lot of parents aren't very happy with me. And I, and to, and when I left Connecticut to go to LA, people didn't hear from me for years. And then all of a sudden they're seeing me online. Like on the East coast, I, I went by Joseph my whole life because my, my middle name is Joseph. When my, my, my father's name was Joe. When he passed, everybody started calling me by my middle name, Joseph. So my whole life I went by the name Joe. I go to LA. I was like, fuck if I, if I, I have to change everything about me if I'm going to do this sober thing. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go by Vinny, my, my actual legal first name. And so if you think about it, all these people that I grew up with, they, they don't hear from me. They don't see me for years. All of them thought of, I have died. Right. Next thing you know, they're fucking seeing me online. You're this internet sensation killing yourself. Yeah. On fucking skateboard ramp. Yeah, exactly. They're seeing me work with my idols, you know, like growing up jackass and especially bam were it for me. It was all I wanted to do. I had, I had all their pictures on my walls. I bam skateboards on my walls, even down to the same tattoos as, as him, you know? So all of a sudden, nobody's seen me talk to me for years. And all of a sudden, they're seeing me in videos with Bam. Well, let me ask you, when you were doing all this stuff and you were, I mean, you were using at a clip that is pretty, you know, you can't really, you can't really compare it with anybody. You know, that level yeah. of, of using is just, you know, it's, it's the highest level of using. Um, yeah. Like I, I certainly can't, I mean, I used a lot of dope, you know what I mean? Like my hat, when my, the worst my habit ever was, is like, I'd shoot 30 bags a day and that was a fucking lot of dope, but that's yeah. not like fucking injecting liquid LSD and, and getting the silk road shit and getting $25 yeah. bundles. It's not the yeah. same thing now, but, but drug addiction is the same thing. You know, the exactly. misery is the same thing. If you do a bag yep. or you do the whatever, but mm -hmm. the, the question is like, your story is so fucking rich, but there was no Bam Margera jackass skateboarding. There was drug dealing and drug taking and touring and $5 yeah. fatties and everything. Like, yeah. w was there, were you skating? Were you doing stunts or was it just something no. that you loved when you were a kid in the back of your yeah. head? So, no. So when I was, I was 12, maybe 13 years old when jackass and bam and CKY big brother, you know, all that shit really hit mainstream and I fell in love and skateboarding was the main hub of it. I loved skateboarding. Me and all my friends skated. My friends were the one that progressed more than I, cause I was always big growing up. I was always a big dude. My friends progressed in skateboarding way quicker than I could ever. Um, but I still loved the sport so much that I just wanted to be involved somehow. So that's how I picked up a video camera and I started, and I started filming all my friends skateboarding and then Jackass and CKY hit and we were pretending that we were them, you know, jumping off into bushes, you know, and shopping carts in the bushes, you know, just, do, just doing fun stuff, fun, stupid stuff with your friends and recording it for your own pleasure, you know? And it was a dream of mine always ever since ever since I first laid eyes on the Jackass logo to either work with these guys or have our own show or to travel the world and just hang out with the bros. It's always been a dream of mine. And then when I started when I started smoking weed, it was I still loved it, still wanted to do it, but the smoking of the weed and the drinking and partying that got in the way, really. But I still loved it. When the opiates came into picture, any passion that I had for anything on this earth just went away. It was replaced with passion for opiates and drugs. Yeah. 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 I was passionate yeah. about opiates. I can tell. Know? Yeah. And all, all that stuff that I told you that I sold, all the camera equipment, all of my computers, you know, everything was just one by one just sold. And then it got to the point where I was mid-20s and I was like, okay, this is never... Like that dream, that passion of mine is never going to fucking happen anyway. So why the fuck even have it in my head? You know? So it got to the point where I didn't even, like I threw out all my skate videos, 
my DVDs. I threw out all my CKY VHSs. I threw out all my band mar- uh, uh, memorabilia. Threw out all my skate decks that I had on my wall, you know? And I just didn't, it was just out of my life. The way that it came into my life is when I went to LA, I was going from treatment center to treatment center, getting either kicked out or leaving, getting high in it, you know, and, and my main thing was uh, I would convince other clients to leave with me, to sure. get loaded with me. Misery loves company, you know? And you're a social dude, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's like, and yeah. it's much less fun to be in a foreign state and, yeah. and leave a treatment by yourself than yeah. to do it with someone else and have the, the laugh and the adventure. And Absolutely. The it's much less, Absolutely. Much, you know, yeah. I get it. So I'm going from treatment center to treatment center. And at this point I, I still had no, I had, I had no want of getting sober. I still, I still loved getting high. I, I didn't want to get sober at all. I was just taking advantage of the health insurance my mom was paying for me monthly just going into these programs, eating food for a few days, sleeping on a bed for a few days, and then just going right back, you know? And uh, this, the last sober living that I got kicked out of, me, I, I convinced two, two guys to leave with me. So we're, we're out front of the sober living, waiting for the Uber to come. The management comes out, find out what we're doing. They convinced the two guys to stay. And then they were like, okay, Vinny, uh, what are you doing? I was like, oh, well, if they're going to stay, I'll stay. She goes, nope, you're out of here <laughs> and kicked me out. So of course I'm going to be like, all right, fine. Fuck that. I have my own money. I'll get high on my own. And so I'm, I'm sitting on the front step waiting for my Uber. And this was the very first spiritual experience I had in my life. It sounded like Randall whispered in my ear saying enough is enough. You're 30 years old. Enough is enough. And it was a very vivid, loud whisper. And it sounded like fucking Randall. And I called up the program director. I was like, listen, man, give me one more shot. He put me into another house. I walk in there and I, that's where I see Zach ass. And I already knew who he was. I, I knew what he was into. I was a fan. And at the time he needed a filmer. And he, he actually, the first thing he says to me was I, I had a, um, a hardogram you know, Bam's little sign that he has, that he reps, you know, the, mm-hmm. the him logo. I had, I had that tattooed that I, I recently got covered right here. And he's like, Oh, you, you have the hardogram tattoo. And I was like, I was like, yeah, he goes, okay, me and you are going to be friends. <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, rad. And then he needed a filmer. I told him that I had experience growing up filming skateboarding. And, um, he invited me to come film a video with him. And the first thing that I filmed for him was, we, we went to Venice Beach and we attached a boxing glove to a, a, a gas-powered RC car. And he laid down spread eagle on the ground and we drove it into his nuts at full speed. And I'm just like, okay, I love this. This is amazing. Okay, let's, this is fun, you know, like not knowing what's going to come out of it. He saw that I knew what I was doing. I, 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 I had, he saw that I had experience with the camera. He, he understood that I know I I was very educated about the culture, about skateboarding and the jackass culture and what he does. So he's like, all right, dude, welcome to the crew. It's so crazy. Yeah. It's, it's continue. And I haven't thought about it. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. And, 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 and at this point, you know, I'm still on the fence of being sober. Right. I'm like, even though I had that spiritual experience, I'm still on the fence my, I'm not having cravings, but I still had that, um, that reservation of a little bit down the line, I'm probably going to get loaded, you know? And, but after that first video, he, he, he edited it, put it online and it's getting, it blew up. It's getting comments and likes and shares by people who I've looked up to my whole life. Tony Hawk, uh, all, all these fucking legends, are seeing something, a piece of art that my name is attached to. So I, I'm, my mind is exploding. I'm like, holy fuck. When I, and this was a month after I had that spiritual experience. It, didn't, it was like quick, right? I'm, and I'm starting to think, holy fuck, after I had that experience, what sounded like my best friend whispering in my ear, enough is enough. What I've been dreaming about my whole fucking life, 
fell on my lap. And then it, it snowballed. It was like a snowball effect. For, I'm just filming for him. And then I meet the, the whole crew, the Too Stupid to Die crew. They had a, TV, they had a show on MTV at that, at that point. So I'm their personal filmer. You know, we're traveling the country filming. And then more opportunities. We, we're, we're doing live stunts on, on stage in front of 8,000 people opening for Wu-Tang in Chicago. Oh and, my and, God. And, and, I'm, and I'm just like, what the fuck is going on here? And this is all in the last three years where you're talking this, about? Yes. Th- all that from filming the first video with Zach to even just the Wu-Tang show was a matter of four months. Four months of, of sobriety, right? And, I, and I, in my head, I'm just like, how the fuck is this happening right now? The funniest thing is like, it's like imagine Bill Wilson in 1939 could, could predict that the spiritual experience in the 21st century involves fucking skateboarding videos, a, a, a gas powered RV car, a fucking boxing glove and yeah. nuts. Like, like that, yeah. that's like, but it is, it, it's like yeah. you had, you know, you had a spiritual awakening, but forget that. You yeah. found a way that your childhood dream could be reborn in you sober. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like pretty yep. fucking awesome. And like, you get to have a good time and be sober. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And could you imagine an old timer, I'm an old timer <laughs> seeing that as the spiritual experience. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it yeah. so funny? It's, funny? it's so dude, it's amazing. And, 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 and remember this is all happening while we're clients of a sober living. Like I'm sleeping in a bunk bed, right? pissing in cups with a curfew, you know, and the, the, the house manager and the owner at the time w- was super cool. I love him to this day. He's a huge part of my, of my recovery. He was, uh, he was allowing us to travel the country and doing these, these, these things as long as we stayed sober and we were honest about everything. He was totally cool with it. You because know? you were, you were, you were realizing your life passion yeah. and, and like, yeah. what? cause there's no point in getting sober if you're going to have a bad time and you're not yep. going to do what you want. But that yep. leads me to a question that I think we skipped over big time. Mm-hmm. You know, I was at a meeting the other day, you know, and someone was talking about growth, you know, and growth over time. And he was at the same time, he was talking about decline and decline mm-hmm. over time. And he literally said this at the meeting, he said, I don't think anybody that gets homeless gets homeless overnight. There's a period when it happens. So you were homeless, you know, you, so how did it happen? So after Vermont, I I made my way back. I'm in my car. How did the trunk of the car end? It, it, so I I went out and, and the way that I, (laughs) the way that I was staying well, I wasn't even getting high. I was just staying well at this point. I would, I would, I would leave my car and I, there was this organic food store in, in Vermont, in Vermont, uh, Burlington. And it had poppy, uh, Tasmanian, uh, poppy seeds by the bulk you could buy. So I would go in there and I would steal five pounds of poppy seeds at a time. And this is something that Randall taught me. If you get a, a, a shit ton of poppy seeds, like really high grade poppy seeds, you get a couple bottles of grapefruit juice. You, you put the poppy seeds in the grapefruit juice and you shake, you shake it for a good hour. You open the cap. You could see all the opium and, and the, it's like a layer of oh opium my God. above uh, the grapefruit juice and you, you could drink it and you get fucked up. Like if you have no tolerance, you get fucked up. But if you're a junkie like me, you, you, you just you stay, stay well. well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I was doing. And then eventually, I, I, the, the last time I did that, I went out and stole some poppy seeds. I go back to my car. My car is gone. They, they towed it. So now I have no car. And then I, so then I finally called my mom. I was like, listen, mom, please, can I come back home if, if I clean my shit up? She's like, yeah, if, if you, but if you get loaded, I'm kicking you out. So I went home, slept on the couch, continued to get loaded. Did you go home with the, with the bag of poppy seeds? What'd you do oh, with yeah. the bag of, yeah. you're like, oh, oh, oh. you got a jug of grapefruit juice and oh, the fucking yeah. Oh, yeah. bag of poppy seeds. Poppy yeah. Seeds. Because I, I would have to take the train home. My mom ordered a train ticket for me. And, um, so I, I made sure that I was, sto- it's like a five hour train ride. So I, I made sure that I was stocked up for the ride. You know? You're like brewing, <laughs> brewing, brewing, brewing poppy juice yeah. on the ride home. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And then, awesome. um, she, anyway, she, gone, she, she got me on the methadone program and I was on the, I was on 90 milligrams 
uh, 90 milligrams of methadone for about two years. Mm-hmm. But I was still getting loaded the whole time. And, and it just so happened, like, when I started doing the methadone, I started smoking more crack. <laughs> I started smoking a lot more crack. And, um, and, and my mom just couldn't have me anymore. So I, w- I started couch surfing again. And eventually it's like, you know how it is, you know, even if it's your fucking best friend, if, if he's sleeping on the couch and he's getting loaded, you can't like, you don't want to be around that, you know? They're so not like your I was, friend anymore. They're gone. Yeah. Like, they're just drug yeah, addicts. exactly. So I, I was just taking advantage of all these people and nobody wanted me anymore. So that's when I was just like, you know what? Fuck it. So I, I found, uh, uh, I found a handicapped size porta potty in East Haven, Connecticut. It was like a couple blocks away from my grandparents' house. And, um, it was kind of. In, in, in the background where it was like at a soccer field that nobody ever came to. Um, nobody ever used it. And it was just big enough for me to make my own, uh, my own bed on the, on the floor of it. And I slept in that thing for a long fucking time. How long? long almost two years. Shut the fuck up. So yeah. the, where was the place you slept before the porta potty? Um, I, so before, right before the porta potty, it would be, I, I would couch surf going from one junkie what was friend like to the another. Last, the last bed or the last couch. The, la- like, the like- last. It, so it was, it was my friend's couch, but we, he was getting high too. You know, like I, I would throw him a couple bags to let me sleep, you know, throw him a couple bags to let me use a shower. Um, and the way that I was getting loaded this whole time, like I didn't have a job. Like I, the way that I was getting loaded is I, I was either robbing people or I would, in Connecticut, they have, or even, even in New York and Jersey, they have things called bodegas, you know, and uh, I'm familiar with them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the bodegas in Connecticut, <laughs> what they do is they, if you have energy drinks, preferably monster or Red Bull, they would buy them off you for a dollar, a dollar a can. So what I would do is I would go in the stop and shop, the big Y's, all these grocery stores. And I would just fill my, I would just fill the carriage up, the shopping cart up 12 packs, 10, 10 and 12 packs up to the brim. And I would just walk out like, right. like I own the, the, the place, you know, and I would go right to the bodega, sell them for a dollar can. I'd make maybe 150 bucks with, with one shop. Yeah, well. and, 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 and the bodega was a one-stop shop. I'd get my needle there. I'd get my, my crack pipe, the, 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 the chore boy. And then right around the corner is I'm, I'm getting the drugs, you know, and then that was the hustle for a couple years. But looking at that porta potty, yeah. having drugs and being like, I think I'm going to live here. Like, yeah. holy, that's a leap. Is that not a leap? Like, that's yeah. like, a, that's a crazy, I, I mean, like in my life, <laughs> like I make the joke all the time that I don't know if I could have been on heroin if I didn't have cable, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, like I cannot, I never would have been able to make that move. Like yeah. what was going on in your head when you made that move? Um, It was, I mean, it, it, it's, I, I honestly, I didn't give a fuck as long as I had enough dope for that day and a, and a, and a decent needle that would still go in my arm. I didn't give a fuck where I was living. I didn't care where I was sleeping. I didn't care who wanted me around. I didn't, I didn't give a fuck. I all, all I cared about was the next high. And, and you know how it is. Like you're always looking for, like I get, I like touching the line of death when I'm getting high. I I'm looking for that high where I'm in, I'm a, a millimeter away from dying. Right. So I'm, I'm always searching for that fucking next, sh- that, that next needle, you know? And it, 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 it was to the point where I, like I said earlier that I, I accepted it. I accepted that I was going to live the rest of my life, a, a lonely drug addict and I was going to die a lonely drug addict. And the, the sick part about it was, I was okay with it. I was totally cool. And it just, it, I, it, I, and then I would continue robbing stores for monsters and red bulls. And I, I ended up getting caught. I did, I did a few months in Hartford. And after that, you know, when, after you fucking do jail time, when you're walking out, going back home, you're like, Oh, I'm done. I'm not stealing anymore. I'm not doing anything. I'm done. The next day I'm, I'm going into a different stop and shop and doing the same thing. Did you go back to the porta potty and you're like, I'm ba- I'm home? <laughs> like, yeah, pretty like, much. Yeah, yeah. And it was there? No, no, no. It's 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 funny because I, after a year of sobriety, 
I, uh, I went, I went back home to visit my mom and I went back to the porter potty. I, I wanted to see it and it wasn't there. <laughs> so they, they took it. <laughs> yeah. And did you, did you shit and piss in it? Yeah. Oh yeah. The whole time. Yeah. The whole time. Yeah. Can you use porta potties yeah. now? Yeah. 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 It doesn't bother me. You're like, oh, this reminds me. me, this reminds me of something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it feels familiar somehow. Yeah. So you'd sleep it's, on the floor. Yeah. I would sleep on the floor. It was a handicap size one. So it was just big enough for me to like spread my legs out, you know? And, um, it's, it's I, like, I could totally look back at it now and, and laugh, you know, and, and, and it's, it, it tends to be a podcast favorite, you know, whenever I tell this story, people love it. And, and I used to, when I was in the sober living in the bunk bed, I would be on the bottom bunk. I, I cut out, um, like I, I got a, a picture of a porta potty from the internet and I printed it out and I posted it, um, underneath the top bunk. So it was the first thing that I saw every, every morning when I woke up. And to just remind me where I fucking came from. So it wasn't like posting your girlfriend up that you missed. It was more of a, yeah. to remind you. Yeah. To remind yeah. you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Man, like, dude, like, I can make fun of a lot of stuff, but like, yeah. that's really, it's really crazy. You know it what is. I mean? It's it, like, it it's like yeah. and when, and I've heard you talk about the insanity, but this yeah. is like, it's actual, total. Actual insanity. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I mean, I've done insane stuff, and again, there's no sense in comparing. But that's <laughs> fucking crazy, 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 crazy business. Yeah, you know. And then, and then, so like, who gave you the ticket to get to LA? So, one of the dudes who ratted on me and had my and had my house raided, he called me when I was I was getting high in the porta potty, and he's like, "Hey, man, word on the street is that you're really struggling, and uh, you need help." And he had since went to California, got sober, and cleaned up his life and, and was doing good, as far as I knew. He called me. He's like, hey, man, I, I will buy you a plane ticket right now if you get on it tomorrow and come to L.A. and go to rehab. The first thing that comes to my mind is, fuck yeah, the weather is amazing in California. Easy as fuck to be homeless. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And I always wanted to go to California. And um, so I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. And so I, I went out there and um, I went to the program that he sent me in. And, but I, I got kicked out right away for hooking up with a chick and getting high with her. And uh, but not knowing that there was. So in Florida and California, there is this thing called body bro- brokering. It's so fucked up. Sure. And he, that's what he was doing. He was getting paid. And I didn't know this at the time. He was getting paid to get me into treatment. The, he, he was like um, getting referral money, you know? And well, the it, fucked up thing about it is that it's like, like if it worked out, it isn't fucked up. You know what I mean? Like if he got you treatment and it's like, and then he got paid, it's a real win-win, right? But the, the fucked up thing about it is, and, and I'm guilty of this as well, when I, when I found out about it. Cause when I'm in the rehab, everybody's like, Oh, how much are you getting paid to come here for? I'm like, what, what do you mean getting paid? They're like, yeah, I'm getting paid $2,000 to be here. I'm like, what? And then I'm putting two and two together. I'm like, Oh, this motherfucker is making so much money off me. And he's not even like paying me. And of course I'm like, this motherfucker is not paying me. What the fuck? So, so I'm an like, idiot. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, yeah. I'm so stupid. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And, and that was another thing that I, that I got into was I, I met another referral out in LA and I, and he was paying me $2,000 every time I, I'd go to detox for two weeks. I'd come out, he'd give me $2,000 and I just continue the cycle over and over again. And it would just be in and out, in and out, in and out. And every time I get $2,000 and then it became, and then it got to the point where I'm like, all right, no, I want more money. So I became the referral because wow. I, I think networking and meeting people. So I knew a lot of fucking drug addicts. So I was like, yo, listen, go to rehab. I'll pay you two, two grand. I'm making five grand. You know what I mean? And it's, it's a fucked up thing. It's really fucked up. I don't think that anybody has ever come on dopey and checked off every box. Like, dude, it's like it's like there isn't a box you didn't check even to the body brokering becoming a body broker the fucking yeah. shooting liquid lsd the shit yeah. i mean every it's pretty crazy you know so yeah. let me ask you this the most important question perhaps yeah. maybe, maybe it's not the most important question but uh-huh. maybe yeah. it's you didn't really go there to get well 
you got there because you're living in a fucking porta potty in the hills of Connecticut and this guy's giving you a ticket. Yeah. When did it did it, it hit you? That spiritual awakening is when it hit you, when you heard Randall's voice. That was the beginning. Yep. And then you see Zach ass and, yep. and then you found joy. That's how it yeah. happened for you. That's how it happened for me. Yeah. And before, before I, before I had the spiritual experience, cause I, I had been in from, from the first treatment center I went into that he, that the dude who ratted on me sent me to, to the spirit, uh, to the spiritual experience that I had, I probably was in a total of maybe 15 different treatment centers out there, but I, I, I wouldn't last more than two weeks, you know? Um, and, right. and eventually I was just like, you know what? Fuck this. So I, I was on skid row for a couple months. I lived on skid row. You and, lived in the street over there? Yeah. I lived on the street. Um, and, and one thing happened to me on Skid Row was I was so dope sick, couldn't find anything. Or no, I, it wasn't that I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find money. Eventually, I, I convinced my mom, because that's what I do. I manipulate the shit out of my mother to send me money. Finally, she sends me money. It's like fucking 11 o'clock at night. I finally score at Skid Row, but everything's closed. I can't go in the bathroom. I, I can't find anywhere to shoot up. So I just said, fuck it. I sat down on the corner, right? In, uh, it was a seventh and San Julian sure. on, in Skid Row. And, yes. um, I, 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 I tie up, I have the fucking tie around my arm, I'm setting up the needle. All of a sudden the cop drives by, puts his light on me and I'm like, Oh fuck. I threw everything behind me, but I still left the tie on my arm. <laughs> and the tie was still on my arm. And he was just like, kid, what are you doing? And I, and I was honest with him. I was like, listen, I came out here to get sober. It's not working. And he goes, do you understand where you are? I was like, yeah. He goes, no, 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 no. This corner, last night, some guy was stabbed to death. Two nights before that, some guy was shot on this corner. And I'm, I'm just like, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, I don't know what to do. He goes, take your shit and get out of here. He didn't take my drugs, didn't take anything. He let me take my drugs and let me walk away. When that happened, I was like, okay, maybe Skid Row is not the place for me. Oh, <laughs> so shit. then I... Yeah, so then I was like homeless on Venice Beach for a little bit and just like slept on the beaches for a while. And then and then going back in, because my mom was still paying for my health insurance, you know, for the private health insurance. So, so you could I, go in I, whenever you really wanted to. Yeah, whenever I really wanted to, I'd go in. And that's when um, I finally went into that last spot and when I had that spiritual experience. It's incredible. And you've been working a 12-step program, that's what you do? Yep. 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 I, I, I've been, I've been slacking the, the past, the past like six months. Um, there really no excuses. I mean, I can try to justify it every left right way possible, you know? Um, but I, I've been slacking a little bit. All right. What are you doing? How's the slacking um, going? I'm not hitting as many meetings as I should be. No sponsees. Uh, how many meetings are you hitting? I, I've, I've hit two meetings in the past, four months. All right. It's not great. I mean, dopey yeah. counts as like 15 meetings though. in one yeah. shot. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. It does not. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean with, uh, I mean to my, to like, to be fair, I, I have been traveling the country left, right, North, South since December, but that's still no excuse. And I, and I have hit some zoom meetings here and there while I was doing that. And I did. How many uh, zoom asked, meetings have you done? <sighs> A couple, a few, a, a few, three. yeah, a, quite a few. Maybe, maybe, maybe ten Zoom meetings since December, and I and I spoke. Wow, I, I was the speaker for maybe three of them. Well, dude, don't beat yourself up. Like yeah. that's that's the the worst thing. The best thing yeah. is like, dude, you seem so good to me. I don't know your problems. You know what I mean? I just know you as a delightful sure. podcast guest, and and, <laughs> and 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 guy who does crazy stunts on the internet, and your stunts yeah. are nuts. Um, crazy you know like and it's so fucking uh you know like because i didn't know your story you know what i mean yeah. like i didn't i didn't yeah. know i just figured you were some like skateboard legend who was a junkie and <laughs> fucked everything up but your whole your whole fame started in the past three years when you got clean yeah i didn't have you know an inst I, mean? I didn't like, have an instagram i didn't have twitter i didn't have anything i had facebook but i had um, i had been off facebook for years and Every, everything started because of Zach and um, he's in and Texas I, I, with you now. No, no, Zach's still in LA. Um, me and I mean, a couple of the other bros from too stupid. They live with me and um, we're just doing the podcast right now until um, I go for this ranch. So you do what? 
they're they're here with me. Two of them are here with me now, and they're and we're just doing this podcast in the meantime that we started until I find a ranch because I'm I'm planning on buying a ten acre ranch within the next few months to um, try to film our own show on and just say fuck it and pitch it to Netflix ourselves. That sounds good. And you'll bring Zach ass in or no? Oh, no. totally, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Zach Zach was so you're. Zach had to stay in LA because um, I, I think I could talk about this now. Um, he's in Jackass Four. Nice. Yeah, he's he's a he's a huge player in Jackass Four now. So, so he. Had, why did they, you they just? Go uh, ahead. Why did you cover up the Bam tattoo? Um, I, I got another one right here. <laughs> I got yeah, I got the same thing right here, but uh, it's it was just. It, I got that when I was 15 years old and it was just done really bad. And I got a good one right here on my neck, but it's, it's weird because I have one right here on my arm. This one right here that I got when I was 15, he has the same thing in the same spot, just a lot bigger. Because when I was that young, I never in my life thought that I'd be like hanging out with him at his house, you know? So it's like now when I'm like with him, I'm like, Oh, I don't really want you to know I'm a fanboy, you know? Like, <laughs> and what does he, what, how does he respond to it? I don't even think he's seen the tattoos yet. <laughs> he came on Dopey one time, but he didn't really know he was on Dopey. Novak yeah. was recording a video bit for, we had, we do a Dopey convention called DopeyCon, and we did DopeyCon too. And Novak was with Bam, and he had yep. Bam in the video clip, but Bam didn't know he was on it. Like Novak, yeah. I'm going to have, Novak's been on like three times or something. Novak came on. Like when Chris was alive, we just found a number to call and he came on and then he came on yeah. after Chris died. And then he came on because I read his book and I wanted to talk about it. And he's, yeah. you know, I love him. He's a, he's a very generous, cool guy. Absolutely. How, uh, I always want to ask everybody how Bam's doing because it's always like such an up and down thing, but that's not, we don't need to go into that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I don't put you yeah. Um, yeah. I won't get into it too much, but um, he's struggling. That's all I could really say. He's struggling. Yeah. Well, you should, as long as like, dude, it's like you can be like some kind of raft in the, in the river that he could swim over to and grab hold of. And like, that's, that's the thing. Uh, when all these guys meet you and you know everything about them and your story uh-huh. is so insane. Do, do, do they know your story? Um, some of uh, Steve-O knows my story. Um, I'm not really out of out of all the guys, it's pretty much just like I've I've worked with Dave England. Um, I've I've hung out with Bam and filmed with him a, a bunch. And Steve-O, uh, I'm close with him. The rest Steve-O, of the guys, I don't really. Steve-O, Steve-O refuses, Steve-O to, refuses come to come on. Dope. Refuses. <laughs> refuses. I don't know why. I don't know why. Like, <laughs> but what I, yeah. Continue. Yeah. Please. Continue. Please. Yeah. Um, all the all the rest of the guys, I don't really know personal like that. Um, I've met, I've met all of them. Um, I was on set with when Zach when they first started filming for Jackass Four right before COVID hit, um, I went to set with, with Zach and I got the, to experience that. And like a couple of them already knew who I was just because I had the podcast with Andy and videos with Zach and sure. stuff. So they, they already knew who I was, which was fucking mind blowing to me. So cool. And, uh, yeah. And, um, and they were all super cool dudes, you know? Um, but the ones that I'm like really close to are Bam and Steve. Well, I think that's amazing. I think you should, I think you should try to be a mis- a dopey missionary to Steve-O for us. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, one day just slip it in. I was on this incredible podcast. So great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, dude, like, I can't thank you enough. Like I, we're not yeah, going to, of course, how long is this run for? Cause I can't, I'm, I've never done a podcast like this without being able to see the time. An hour and 49 minutes. That's not that bad. Shit. No. What time, what time is it? Um, it is four o'clock my time. So five o'clock your time. Let me see. Am I going to make my train? Am I going to not make my train? I'm not going to make my dad. I'm not going to make my train. My wife is going to be pissed. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I live in the suburbs. I live in the suburbs. I have two kids. And I work at a deli. And I make this podcast. This podcast. just about everything you need to know about me. But I'm going to read a dopey. I'm going to read a dopey. Did I send you the emails or not? Did I send you the emails or not? No, I don't think so. Fuck. Um, um, here, why don't you read? Here, why don't you read? Send it to you right now. Send it to you right now. Okay, are okay, you ready? Are okay, you ready? Yep. Hold on. Hold on. You want me to text it to you? Want me to text it to you or email it to you? Um, you could text it to me. All right. I got a short one and a long one. Really long one. Really long one. Really long one. The short one. Either one. We could do both if you want. All right. Cool. Let's do it. Hold on. Let's do it. Hold on. 
Yeah, da, 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 da. Um, yeah, da, 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 um, this one's fucked this up. One's I think you should up. read this I one. I think you should read this one. I'll do the big one first. Do the big one should first. I text it or email? Uh, I text it or email it? Uh, um, email it? Yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. Email. Yeah, yeah, email it. Okay, hold on. Damn, Bitcoin is down. How much? What's your email? Uh, my email is V I N I M P 666 at Gmail. Bitcoin's down 4% today. It's down to 34.5. Well, what do you, what do you predict? <sighs> I don't even fucking know, dude. I, I put in $5,000 <laughs> a couple months ago <laughs> and I'm kind How, of, where was it then? Where was it? Then? Um, when I, when I put in, it was at 42. Yeah. I think most yeah. of what I think I bought mostly at like fifth at, at 42 also like some stupid yeah. move. Every, I mean, you know, it's like, how are you knowing? Dude, you and, know and, and fucking about- when I was on, when I was on that tour, I, I was in Florida and it was, uh, this was in December, the end of December, and it was at 33. And I'm on the phone with, with Tom, my manager. I'm like, all right, Russo, I'm gonna like let's fucking let me do this. Let me do this. He goes, No, let's let's wait till you get home, you know. And then when I got home, it fucking jumped up to 45 and right, right, like, right, 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 right. You know? Yeah, it's like you have to move swiftly, and then you yeah. have to get lucky, and then you have to get out of yep. it quickly. You know, it's like, and I think it's really all this stuff, it's it becomes incredibly um tricky for addicts to deal with cryptocurrency you know i'm (laughs) serious i'm not even kidding yeah i want to do a whole special about it like because i know a bunch of people a bunch of dopey nation people who are just like into shiba and doge and they're up one day and they've lost everything the next and it's like it's a whole thing and i want to get rich we all want to get rich right you know what i mean my dad my dad says it's too volatile here, let's let's get you want to get my dad's take on this really quickly. Yeah, this is this is Skinny Vinny. He's a he's a big time uh, Instagram. You, are you bigger on YouTube or Instagram? Instagram, Instagram for okay, sure. Big time Instagrammer. Hold on, this is my dad. This is Alan. He's a longtime professor and 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 high school junior high school teacher. There you go. Hi, hello. What do you? Hey, what's what up, you, Alan? About, um, Hi. Well, my my advice to everybody is: if you don't understand what you're investing in, you shouldn't invest. The other <laughs> advice, the, the other advice is: try to invest in things for long term. Term and uh, volatile yeah. is is a bad word. A good word is steady and a company with uh, good reports financially. That's what I recommend. The the cryptocurrency sounds to me like I do not understand it. And maybe it's the wave of the future. But right now, I think people are getting ripped off. Vinny made his mark on the world by putting a a, a boxing glove on a a remote controlled car and running it into this guy's testicles. What? Sound like a good idea at so, all. So volatile <laughs> might be good for Vinny. <laughs> maybe, maybe Vinny, maybe cryptocurrency is perfect for you. <laughs> Thanks for the <laughs> advice, man. <laughs> all right, all right. Good luck. That's my dad's very steady. He's very oh, steady. Yeah. Uh, um. So you got? Did you get the email? Uh, let me check. Oh, yep, got it. All right here. Um, I'm gonna read it as I okay. put on my pants. Yep. Hey, Dave, this addict right here sent you a funny story a couple weeks ago, but now I'm writing this to you. I don't know. Fucking decompress it from my heart. I don't expect you to share this one because it's not a funny drug story or anything even remotely worth anyone hearing. This is more just, I guess, therapeutic writing for me. So thanks for reading it if you do. It took me three days to fully write this stupid email anyway. I've always had a soft spot as an ER nurse for my addicts and alcoholics. Being an alcoholic myself and the product of an alcoholic coke crack addict, but I, but I just pulled my first OD patient out of a car after being part of the Dopey Nation and falling in love with you and Chris, fucking RIP. And it was pretty standard as far as overdoses go. He got dumped at the front door by his friends, purple and barely breathing, barely had a pulse. We rushed him. To the back, I'm bagging him, slam Narcan internasal, uh, in, in, internasally while we throw an IV into his neck so we can slam another into his vein and then wrestle for 10 minutes while this poor dude alternately screams, cries, shits, and vomits. Typical scene. So perspective-wise, my dad is the only person I have personally known who I'd ever seen overdose. When he was living with me on hospice due to alcohol-induced liver cancer cirrhosis, 
He overdosed on Xanax and I got him to the hospital and was fine. Well, I mean, well, I mean, he died of cancer later. So not really fine, I guess. But anyway, I've been fortunate enough to, I've been fortunate enough that no one I know personally has overdosed on heroin, but listening to dopey, I feel like you and Chris are my homies now. So I felt, I don't know more emotions this time during the, uh, uh, the reason, I don't know that word, <laughs> but anyway, what is that? I missed it. Uh, okay, keep going. But anyway, back to this poor guy. One, I finally got him calmed down and the Narcan-induced psychosis passed. He was so sweet and tenderhearted. He was a mess. He was not even 30 years old and covered in meth sores and track marks, missing tons of teeth. But you could just tell he had a kind heart and had been a fucked up situation for a long time. He kept apologizing for overdosing. I pulled him aside and I was like, dude, please. No one apologizes. Uh, no one apologizes for having diabetes. You have a disease. Anyway, we talked, and this poor kid had been using heroin since high school and had never been formally to rehab. I ended up talking to him for a while, and he just fell apart. He felt so trapped, and my heart broke because resources in our area are so limited and shitty. I don't know. It just sucked because I feel like this poor kid isn't going to make it, and there's nothing I could do for any of them. There will be probably there will be probably hundreds of more people. I will pull out of cars in my career and there isn't a goddamn thing I could do to help any of them long term because they can't change until they want to change and have and have the resources. I've gotten I've gotten to episode 48 but after that patient for some reason I skipped forward to the episode right after Chris died. I feel like even though I always have known addiction is a disease and always have been compassionate to my overdose patients, listening to Dopey has increased my empathy tenfold because now it feels personal. I will never never see these situations the same. Because I always see a little bit of Chris in them. Okay, I guess that's enough rambling. Love the podcast. It's my go-to on my hour-long commute. Toodles. GB. That's deep. And I yeah, thought yeah. it could it could have been you that she found. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a, I thought, like, it could have literally been you. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like, that story could have been about finding you and Narcanning you. You know? Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. We have the next one. And, uh. Yeah, read the next one. It's much shorter and sweeter. Uh, I have some crazy news. I left Matt, my husband, on 31421. I'm getting a divorce. I stopped smoking my medical weed recently today. I have 19 days of complete sobriety. My childhood friend got out of prison eight months ago. He served 18 years. I just celebrated 18 years with Matt on, t- on 22821. Matt started drinking, and I knew I had to run. I had not picked up alcohol since 626 2016. Started smoking weed during COVID after I got fur, uh, furloughed on 3 2020. Smoked for a, uh, a full good year. I loved it. Somehow I fell in love with this year. Or no, some, some, uh, somehow I fell in love with this convict who's going to be on parole for the next 20 years, who, by the way, is my, uh, a registered sex offender, had, had sex with a 17-year-old when he was 20. The girl was scared of, uh, of her parents, said she was raped, and then tried to take back her story. But it was too late. He got thirteen. He got thirteen to forty years. Got out eighteen years later. So, what do you think of this dopey share? Anyhow, I hope all is well. Thanks for letting me share this. What do you think? <laughs> That's a, God, dude. That's uh. That's something that I want no part of. <laughs> wow, well, he's twenty. The girl's seventeen. Yeah, that's that's reasonable. It, it is. It is reasonable and. Uh, that whole that whole conversation is is I can go on and on for that. Like this girl who I just recently fell in love with, she's twenty and I'm thirty three. You know, there like, you go. Good for you. Enjoy you it while know. you can, man. These are these are the salad days, Vinny. These are, these she, are the we don't talk. We, we don't talk anymore, and I and I'm literally sulking in my depression the last couple months. But <laughs> so why why aren't you talking? What happened? Um. Uh, so. When I was on that tour from December to March, I, at first, this, this is going to sound really fucked up. At first, I was naming it my STD tour. I was planning on yeah. I was planning on going to every state and hooking up with a girl in every state. And yes. I made it. I, I left LA, made it to Phoenix, hooked up with a girl in Phoenix. And then this girl was going to be my second in Texas. And we had been talking for a year before this on FaceTime. Like she, she slid through my DMs. We started talking. We started to like each other. And then when I, when I found out I was leaving, I was like, Hey, I'm going to come meet you, you know? And, um, so meeting her was planned, but the feelings that I got for her were not. And, um, this was on Christmas week. I I was down here and had Christmas with her and her whole family. 
it was it was an amazing thing and i even i even shared i i even led a meeting in her mom's kitchen with her mom there told my whole life fucking story and i was terrified fucking terrified to do this because i didn't it was really soon for her mom like her mom knew me like knew that i'm an addict and lived in a sober living for years worked in treatment she knew me but she didn't know to the extent of like the porter potty and everything else you know the I'm anal terrified. sex and the shit coming out and love <laughs> yeah. in the shower yeah, no. yeah. so I, okay. so i was fucking terrified doing this in front of her and i did it and afterwards she was like she's like why why do you look like you're you're so scared right now. I was like, I was like, honestly, I was afraid to say all that in front of you just because like, I, I really like your daughter and I just didn't, it was really too soon, you know? And she goes, no dude, like I actually have more respect for you because you did that. And I don't judge anybody. And you aren't the person who that was all those years ago, you know, like you are you now and the things that you are doing now to help people are amazing, you know? And when she said that, I, I fell even deeper love with this girl because of her family. They didn't judge me. and But she kept, this girl, t- even though we had sex a few times, she kept telling me that she wasn't ready for a relationship. So I was like, I'm in no rush. I'm still on tour. I don't even know where I'm going to be living. I have all this shit that I have to do. That's fine. But I would like to continue being like, like talking to you. She's like, yeah, of course. I finally make it back to Connecticut. I have I, I I end up going to Travis Pastrana's house in Maryland. I go to Bam's castle, get a bunch of good footage, and uh, she just and and we had this plan that I, I I bought plane tickets. I was gonna fly down there, pick her up. We were gonna fly to L.A. celebrate my three years sober in L.A. and then I was gonna fly her back to Texas and then me fly back to Connecticut. Bought the plane tickets and then all of a sudden she starts getting cold feet. You're, you're always, uh, you always have a camera rolling. You're always in the public eye. I'm very, I'm very shy person that scares me. And then she goes and starts saying stuff like, and and it scares because she drinks. She's like, no, she's a normie. You know, she parties with her friends and she's like, and it scares me that like, because me and my friends drink that it might tempt you. And I'm like, listen, I have the work that I've put in the past three years, allow me to be around that shit. Like that shit doesn't bother me anymore. And then we just faded a little bit. I came, moved down here because I'm looking for a fucking ranch and I, I, we didn't talk on social media for a little bit. And then I go on snap. Is, there? Is she in Texas? She's like an hour away. Did you move to Texas to get her back? Partly. Yeah. Partly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm also looking for, uh, uh, for land and Texas is really cheap. For, and for Joe Rogan land. did it. It worked for Joe Rogan. It could yeah. work for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so we didn't talk. We, we faded apart for a little bit. And then I found out she got, she got a boyfriend on Snapchat. Uh, so, so I fucking, um, um, I, 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 and I'm not, I'm usually not the person to do this, but I blocked her on everything. I blocked her and her friends on everything. And, uh, because I just couldn't stand to see her, you know, I, I had to like get her out of my brain. I think it's, I think it's a very sober move. You protect yourself. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't get it out. Still couldn't get her out of my fucking head. She's the last person I think of before I go to bed. The first person I think of when I wake up. Um, and for months, I, I can't stop thinking about her and obsessive thinking. Just, yeah. And just yesterday I, I wrote a fucking letter that I'm going to mail out to her tomorrow. <laughs> what does it say? You want me to read it? <laughs> yeah. Read it. Sure. sure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> One second. Cat. <laughs> the first thing that probably comes to your mind when seeing this is why the 